Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with a special news update. Tis the season for joy and sharing in our beloved town, and everyone is getting in on the holiday spirit. Even our staff is participating in the great holiday tradition of Secret Santa. For those of you not familiar, Secret Santa is where you draw the name of a random coworker and then confide in them your darkest secret that they must take with them to the grave. It promotes great team building. And now, a weather update. The weather outside is frightful, but the fire... The fire reminds you of the raw power and fragility of your own mortality. You are listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I am one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And Benjamin Graham. Merry Constant Readers, everyone. <laughs> As you may have noticed, even though this is a bi-weekly podcast, we are giving you a podcast on an off week because uh, we decided that it'd be fun to do a, a Christmas special, uh, a Merry Dairy Christmas to everyone. And we wanted to take this time to step away from just going off the books we're reading and discuss kind of everything we have read so far with a couple of uh, questions and a couple of games that I've put together uh, for this episode, which you guys have no idea what's about to happen. I I love games. (laughs) (laughs) Great. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, we just wanted to take the time, uh, do something uh, out of the ordinary because we've uh, enjoyed talking to all of you guys listening to our show on Facebook and on Instagram. And this is just going to be a fun episode to kind of maybe get to know us a little bit more, uh, some of our more just personal opinions about everything we've talked about. And I thought this would be a fun way to to give our, our listeners something fun to do. I'm definitely having fun uh, because of how distressed CM feels. <laughs> you seem like you don't like surprises so much. My palms are sweating. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So I'm going to throw out our first discussion question uh start off with something easy over everything we have read who is your favorite stephen king hero boy annie wilkes (laughs) no no ah, cut her mic cut her mic (laughs) okay i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) of course that's your favorite she just saved paul's life she She is truly a hero she did save paul's life (laughs) Yeah, so it, it's been a long year. We've we've been doing this for how many months and seven books? So we've got a, some good choices. Sure. Oh, uh, we'll recap for the listeners uh, the books that we are going to be discussing. Everything we've read: Carrie, Joyland, The Dark Half, Different Seasons, Misery, and Salem's Lot. I think my favorite hero might be our original Carrie. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to decide whether Carrie's, she's not exactly a hero hero. She's a victim of circumstance. (laughs) Yeah, maybe an anti-hero. Sure. I don't know, just as she's, she's the prototype. She's the, the first, the alpha of uh, (laughs) King's Over and our podcast. Yeah. So she holds a special, special little place in my heart. And she blew up a bunch of stuff, (laughs) which is totally sweet. That is super metal. I like that answer. Right? Now I have to think of a different one. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do, you, um, do you have well, answers to these questions, Josh? I sure do. Yeah, what, who's your favorite? Uh, I, I thought long and hard about this question because I had a long time to prepare. Yeah, what a, what a <laughs> wonderful uh, privilege you had. <laughs> uh, I, my favorite hero is, I think, kind of an odd choice, but it's uh, Sandra Stansfield from The Breathing Method. Really? Yeah. That's so weird because I was going to say mine is Dr. Emlyn. Weird! From The Breathing Method. That's, That's so awesome! <laughs> Very crazy, guys. No, I, I just like, and, and yeah, I mean, she, she's, uh, she's triumphant. Like, I think like what she does is incredibly heroic. Like, that she, she held on after death to safely birth her child. Like, there's something so bad bad ass about that and i just I, I i think that's like probably like one of the most i guess heroic achievements i feel like has happened in a story that we've read was she real 
Yeah. Because she... <laughs> okay. no, good question. No, okay. Go on. <laughs> so so she existed in the story within the story right. of right. the breathing method. Was that a true story within it, the It was told world as an autobiographical of... story. Okay. Hold on. Guys, just real quick. So we, we discussed a lot about the, the club and the all that during the breathing method. Is it possible that the club chose him to be a member because they knew he had that story in him? Yes. <laughs> that, that is a club secret. Oh, I love that. Man. Yeah. We talked a long time about how oh. they choose their members and how that, I mean, that's a pretty crazy. Yeah, or, or it draws people who have had these like out of this world experiences that yeah. who are also willing to share them. Okay. That's super that's fair. weird. Yeah. I dig that. Uh, honestly, I, I expected uh, Andy to show up a I, little. I thought you were going to pick Andy, list. honestly, Ben. <laughs> I, I do love Andy, but uh, I mean, I like the underdog. Sure. No, I get it. So, uh, CM. My choice is in part influenced because of how much I enjoyed that story, The Breathing Method. The way he told it and his relationship with Sandra, it made him a hero of that tale for me. I love your answer. Because <laughs> Sandra is the true hero of that. But that doctor, I mean, he invented Lamaze. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, exactly. That's so funny that our answers are from the same thing. <laughs> Especially from probably one of the least well, probably I would say the breathing method is the least well known of Definitely. everything we've and read so far. And nearly almost the lowest rating. Yeah. That's true. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I, got, I will admit that that story has grown on me quite a bit. That's the magic of King. It really is. <laughs> and I have completely not thought of it at all <laughs> since we recorded. Yeah, <laughs> that, that makes sense. Uh, all right, let's uh, move on to our next question. Uh, I'm sure you can guess if we're discussing our favorite heroes. Who is your favorite villain? I As we all glance very <laughs> casually, <laughs> you would at be CM. surprised. <laughs> I, Actually, I'm going to be shocked if it's not uh, unanimous around the board. Ooh, because right. I know I, CM and I are going to have the same answer. Is yeah. it George Stark? No. <gasps> oh, no. Oh, who, what was your answer? The one and only Annie Wilkes. Okay. We don't all have the same like, answer. The, God the damn. Problem, the problem is that when earlier I answered the hero question <laughs> with Annie Wilkes, uh, <laughs> I that, that was, was not a joke. Mostly, she only drew joking. back because we laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys' reaction made me realize not okay. <laughs> so I changed it. No, I that is a hard one because so far. So far, Annie Wilkes and George Stark have been my favorite villains. They evoke the most response in me, and I enjoy them so much. But uh, Annie is tragic and vulnerable in a way that George Stark isn't, Mm -hmm. that, that keeps her from being a true, complete villain for me. See, that's the reason I like her the most, is because I enjoy that she's not just like a cartoonish force of evil uh although george stark is awesome because of that uh i i enjoy uh, a villain who is humanized and uh and, and realistic and i think she's all the more terrifying for it i agree with that but i think george is more terrifying because he also has an opportunity to be humanized and be vulnerable given a situation because he's relying on another person for his very life and that person does not want him to live because that means that he dies, that he has that opportunity and does not take it and is just like pure evil makes him more of a villain for me. Hmm. And we don't really know what would have happened had George's plan worked because we, it, it, when they become more connected and as they get closer, uh, if I remember right there, they talk about like the weirdly more human George's like how George is with the kids. Mm -hmm. Like, even though, there's the line about like you can tell that he's doing he's acting that way because he thinks he should be able to and so he is but if he would have taken over maybe some of that would have some of thad would have stayed i think some would but george was written to be bad so he's always going to be bad in in the way that thad had elements of george in him i think had george won he would have 
had elements of Thad in him, but he mostly would have been bad. Yeah. Yeah. That bad probably. ass. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, well, I guess since we disagreed, you're our tiebreaker, Josh. Uh, I, I picked neither of those. Oh, gasp. who else is there? Barlow. Interesting. That, now, for all of the bullshit I gave <laughs> that book, that face-off with Barlow and Callahan yeah. is hands down the coolest oh. head-to-head yes. that we have read. And we have read some pretty awesome head-to-heads. That showdown. Now, if we ha- if one of your questions is what's the best scene in every book that we've done, <laughs> that's top of the list for me. For I sure. That is agree. high up there. That book went the only way it could, really, but I I can only imagine the other stories that exist in Barlow's universe with as old and has, as powerful as he is, and not as stupid stupid as he is in the movie <laughs> when he He's can actually intriguing. talk <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh <laughs> but like yeah i mean i can't i can't even imagine like the cool vampire stories that exist uh, because of him and, and the destruction he's wrought with that that grand attitude that he has like he has so much evil charisma which is also a thing i really liked about george stark because george stark was actually who i was originally thinking of hmm. and then yeah that i thought about if that actually that train of thought took me to George and Thad uh, facing off. And then I was like, well, if I'm thinking about face offs, man, that shit, Barlow grabbing that cross and just folding it in his hand. So amazing. So fucking cool. Man, I didn't even think of a Barlow prequel. (laughs) I want to read that now really bad. Totally. Well, and it's also interesting because the, and this is me thinking way too far into this character that we don't even know that much about, but as the book goes on, when every time he feeds, he gets younger. We we establish that in in the book, but based on how old he looks the first time, how long has it been since he's fed? Because if you know, with vampire lore, usually the older and more powerful you are, the longer you can go without feeding. Like you don't mm-hmm. have to do. You're not as compelled per se. As he said in the showdown, I was young. When your church was still founding its tenements. Yeah. He was young when Catholicism, or he was old when Catholicism was being invented. Yeah. That's That's fucking crazy. Amazing. So now imagine the story that took place to drive Barlow into hiding for as long as he was, however long he was. I'm guessing the way he talks about Callahan that it was a priest. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yep. That makes a lot of sense. He's got some, he's got a chip on his shoulder. (laughs) (laughs) Barlow Origins. Barlow versus the first Pope. <laughs> oh my God. That's how the lineage of Popes began. That's why they, they had to die to get a new one. <laughs> popes were trained to fight Barlow. <laughs> Pope V Barlow. I'm into it. Let's write the, let's write that spec script and get it going. All right, guys. Now uh, we're going to get to a little more critical thinking stuff. This is the, we're ramping up the difficulty with the, with these questions. All right. You can do your own drawing of the three to pull in your personal quartet. Who Fuck. do you pull? <laughs> from, from the books that we have read. Yep. That's... Uh, right? I got it. All right. Okay. Go for okay. it. Okay. Oh, God. Now, if I can remember the names, um, is it Michael from Joyland? The little yep. boy? Yep. Because he's yep. a badass. He, he's your Jake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then probably... Uh, Mark Petrie. He's my other Jake. <laughs> and then, the three Jakes. Um, and then I'd have to say Annie, just to like mess things up, throw a wild card <laughs> in it. To she's, Annie Wilkes. Yeah, Annie Wilkes. She's my... my she's, yeah, us. she's your wild card. <laughs> that is an insane team. <laughs> I, I only had a minute to think I would, about it. I would read that book. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, now is Mike just is it just because of the shining? Yeah, I think that that's very that's going to be very useful for our quartet. I I think it is a very um bold choice to choose a terminally ill <laughs> child. I was, I was thinking uh-huh. that too. You don't know what's going to happen in a different world. That's true. That time has uh has moved on. And Maybe he's not terminally ill in my world because there are other worlds than these. 
That I is can't argue with that. Very. <laughs> Mike, she just dropped her mic. She on just the floor. mic dropped. <laughs> this equipment is expensive. Pick that back up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so okay, so we're we're drawing three. Yep. Does this preclude that we are we are on our quest to the tower? Yeah. Where we're in this situation. Right. A See, gunslinger. Ben's got the right idea. He's asking questions. Okay. <laughs> okay no, Annie is going to fuck up Charlie the Choo Choo when we get there. That is fair. <laughs> uh, she just stands in front and punches it in the yes. face. Yeah. And that's the, it. The TikTok man shows up and he's like, I'm going to, oh, you just broke my shins. <laughs> with a fucking hammer. I stand by my answer so uh, far. Annie looks as the, the D&D classic barbarian build, two two-handed <laughs> weapons on her back, just strolling through it. <laughs> Definitely Mark Petrie is a real good, good get. Yeah. Because he could honestly just be Jake's twinner. Mm-hmm. He, he really yeah. could. He's a no-nonsense badass, and uh, I think you give that kid a gun, he's going to be able to... Yep. to remember the face of his father even if his father is a dipshit that died in his kitchen i was gonna say even um, if you could re- recognize his face because it was smashed into no. his mother's face <laughs> not if you're watching the movie yeah oh, then but they're it was gently. just a gentle mush <laughs> next i think i have to choose andy if i'm ha- if i have to personally march across an endless desert I'm going to need someone with me to be like, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah, Because I'm going to be like, fuck the (laughs) Endless persistence and hope. Yeah. uh, I'm going to need that Mm because that's not my jam. (laughs) Uh, And third, let's see. I got to, I got to pick a good one. Can I give you my other one? (laughs) That I didn't get a pick. Uh, Oh, is it Ian McKellen's character from (laughs) Apple (laughs) Pupil? How? How useful would Carrie's power be? It really would be. She's well. She'd be. The problem is she's a breaker. Obviously, there are going to be listeners that have never read the. Dark <laughs> I have no idea what. And they are like, they're I have checking out. <laughs> no idea what is happening right now. Oh God. Uh, let's say M- Mike's mom, because she's also a crack shot. Yeah. Other yeah. Annie. Yeah, uh, other Annie. Other Annie. Uh, Because she's a trained marksman. That's true. Like, Mm -hmm. of course. Oh, God, that's a, yeah. Yeah, she's a gunslinger. That makes so much sense. Yeah, Yeah, perfect. Her kid's dead, so. (laughs) (laughs) No, her kid's just with my content. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What about you, Josh? This is really funny because we all have Mark Petrie. Like, we (laughs) all selected Mark Petrie. (laughs) That dude is a gunslinger. Straight if there up. ever was one, it is. It Hell is yeah. Uh, and then CM busted out mine, which was Carrie. Carrie yeah. I definitely like <laughs> Carrie's telekinesis. That's the smart one. Would be huge. <laughs> would be a huge asset. And I feel like part of her problem is her environment. Like take take yeah. her out of that world and and put her in a world that is uh, uh, about a team. Then you don't. You have no idea how that could turn out and i would be really willing to roll the dice on that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, worst case scenario scenario she rips me in half with her brain exactly what? but really only if i'm a dick to her true like through that that's that's really all i gotta do is stay on her good side Man, okay can i trade my terminally ill kid for carrie no nope. <laughs> should be carrie nope. Petrie, and nope, will you're stuck no nope, <laughs> you're <laughs> stuck with your content uh and my third who is my wild card George Stark. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, okay. so there's something wrong with me and Josh. I guess. <laughs> You're the only sane one, Fucking Ben. Fucking evil motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, hey, that, that George Stark thing supports, uh, I believe, listener Philip. Yeah, Phil is, Thiessen. Yeah. He sent us that question asking if George Stark was a gunslinger, and we True. talked about that yeah, a little bit. We posted bit. on our oh, Facebook. He is now. Check it out if you missed <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, now he is. <laughs> That's, yeah, that, I don't know, man. You know, George Stark's kind of a wild card. It's as long as something is in his self interest, mm-hmm. I think he'd be invested. And if that self interest involved keeping me, Mark, and Carrie uh, alive, then and, I feel like he would do it. And you definitely want to help a murderous psychopath get to the room at the top of the tower. That's that's and definitely George where Stark he is, and he's a means to an end. George Stark does not survive the trip to the tower because his <laughs> his own actions will undo him eventually. Fair. Because either he will take something a step too far and he'll pay the ultimate price, or if he turns on the party, Carrie will melt his brain. 
True. I think that although it's clear that the three of us are supposed to make it to the tower in our katets, I think I kind of screwed myself. <laughs> Annie is going to make it no matter what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's true but on the plus side you know that if something happens to you she can just throw you over her shoulder and oh, yeah. fucking dead weight carry you all the way to the tower if she needs to <laughs> classic Annie Wilkes <laughs> alright now we're getting to my favorite game I don't like oh, this oh, I'm so <laughs> I excited like the look on his face. Um, cause CM we are going to you first great wait this one this one's <laughs> just for you guys specifically okay oh Okay. We're going to play the game of Mary Fuck Kill. Oh, I don't like this <laughs> at all. This will be uh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you unfamiliar with the rules of Mary Fuck Kill, it's exactly what it sounds like. I'm going to give them each three names, and they're going to have to assign one person to the Mary category, the Fuck category, and the Kill category. Jesus. And the best thing about this is I had to go through and make one of yours worse. Because <laughs> when I did the other one, I was like, oh, that one was not bad enough. Wait, <laughs> tell, me, a- tell me I'm the one you had to go back to. <laughs> you are gonna find out. All right, CM, your, your three contestants. Uh, Todd Bowden, apt oh, pupil. Oh, God. Yeah, the, the apt pupil, as it were. I think uh, I know what I'm gonna do with him. Billy <laughs> Nolan from Carrie. <laughs> Barf. <laughs> and Thaddeus Boma. <laughs> oh, what you gonna do with Fatty Daddy? Well, I hate you. <laughs> Just for that piece right there. <laughs> Clearly, I have to kill Todd, man. Obviously. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Yep. I wanna. I'm gonna choose him for my kid, whether he's on my list or not. And uh, I gotta tell you, I think I'm gonna need that. That raw cut of corn oh, through yeah. butter, sweet <laughs> fucking from Billy Noel. <laughs> and that you made me say that. I'm I, going home. I am now dead inside. <laughs> so, of course, I would marry Thad, the writer, because. Because he'd make a good dad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that made me so happy. Uh, CM has left the show. This is <laughs> our last episode. Uh, all right, Ben. Oh, I'm excited for Are this. you ready for yours? And by that, I mean... That's it better be worse than mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, That was pretty bad. That was horrible. <laughs> those were not easy choices to make. And one of them is make. a child. I can't do <laughs> hey, either of those other things to a child. He's, he's 18 by the end of it, isn't he? He's an adult. He's still a child. He's still a child. <laughs> Not to mention all the hobo murders, but Ugh. he is only 18. And the bird. Unless you watch the movie. <laughs> then he's a child forever. <laughs> all right. Can we not talk about apt people anymore? <laughs> Too bad, because we're going to talk about apt people right now. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Because, oh, oh, God ben, damn you. you <laughs> I know what's going to happen right I now. promise you, you don't. You. Your three. Annie Wilkes. Of course. Margaret White. Ugh. Or Monica uh, Bowden. Monica Baby. Uh, wait, who? <laughs> Todd's, Todd's mom. mom. <laughs> I thought you were going to make it the counselor. I thought you were going to make it Ian McKellen. I know you did. That's why I told you I promise you it's not. You get, He gets Monica. Come on, man. That is a cheat. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, she has no uh, discernible characteristics. <laughs> Except for just being... Ignorant and <laughs> willfully ignorant and okay. the most complacent human in the world. <laughs> so Annie Wilkes, Margaret Wright, Wright <laughs> and the mom from Apt Pupil. And Monica, baby. <laughs> uh, so I guess I gotta marry Monica because <laughs> I can just get away with... Really? Uh, yeah. You wouldn't marry Annie? Uh, no. Annie's gonna, a caretaker, Ben. I'm, I'm gonna fuck Annie because I bet she's freaky. Oh. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Obviously, she got that weird shit going on. <laughs> That's the we've best seen thing ever. Some, we've seen deep into Ben. It's scary. <laughs> oh my God. Come on. You know. <laughs> I can't. You know what's I up. Can't. <laughs> 
oh, I'm going to end up chopped up in the woods. <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm going to kill Margaret Wright, uh, White because she didn't get killed to, your satisfaction. to my satisfaction <laughs> in the book. Here's where you fucked up, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Let me, let me tell you where you fucked up here. What I do bad. You fucked Annie Wilkes and then married someone else. Oh, oh no. <laughs> it was a trap. <laughs> I lured you in by giving you what you thought was a safe bet. Oh, man. You got, got bamboozled. It. Ben's story does not end happily. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that was God. a fun, terrible game. Fine. Okay, so we got to obviously come up for one with... Uh, for Josh. Oh, uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, hold on. on I, I can do this. All right. Uh, off the top of my head. Okay. Oh, we're not going to, like, powwow this? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how without just making Josh leave. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, earmuffs. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take the, the oh, headphones off. But you realize we're in the same room. If I take my heads off, I can hear you probably better. Studio is very large, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> uh... I don't know. Okay, I'll pick one, you pick one, and then we'll conference. <laughs> um, Good. Oh, no. So my choice is going to be Boggs from Shawshank, from Shawshank mm-hmm. Redemption. All right. Is it Dudley? Oh, Dud. The landfill the guy from The landfill guy Salem's from Lot. Salem's Lot. Yep. Weird that you guys are giving me dudes. But all right. Hey, that's weird for you, man. <laughs> you shouldn't have done what you did to it's us. 2018. <laughs> that's true. Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck these dudes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, God. I love how well orchestrated your guys' powwow is going oh, yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, go for okay. it. Okay. All right. Mama said... Jesus Christ, Which, that cop from the <laughs> dark <cat>. ass. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, you guys are twisted. <laughs> also, all three dudes. All right. I'm gonna the, the, the third option, if you do not want to choose, is to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I stand by it. I'm answering this question. Uh I am I'm uh I'm gonna kill Dud. Mostly for CM's benefit because of the rats. Like Aww. pay it back for the rats. And he had a creepy fascination with that yeah, child. I know gross. what you're doing, and it's working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fuck Boggs, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I assume I'm I'm not gonna be on the other end of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's he's got his style, I guess. <laughs> it's if it's good enough for Andy, it's good enough for me. Oh, this is very distasteful. <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> yep, you set me up. I'm Oopsies. knocking it down, and uh, and I'm gonna marry the. The cop, because it sounds like his family's really nice. <laughs> and I bet, I bet my new... <laughs> I just, I'm saying I bet my new mother-in-law, it will be great, and she has all sorts of great insights. <laughs> and she'll oh, just be a great family. For fuck's sake. <laughs> wow. Oh, what a dumb episode this is. <laughs> I love it. Oh god, it's so ridiculous. Alright guys. Uh, we're gonna switch the game up a little bit. We're gonna All play. Right. We're gonna play a little. Would you rather? Ooh, I love it. So this is for for both of you to, can to we, give your answers. Can we just make note of the fact that both Josh and Ben are comedians and improvisers? <laughs> I am none of those things. Okay, continue. <laughs> but, you, but you are equally hilarious, <laughs> mostly <laughs> unintentionally. But you are hilarious. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Your first. Would you rather? Would you rather? Escape Shawshank, a la Andy, crawling through those miles of shit to freedom, <laughs> or wear the fur all summer. Ooh. Wear the fur. Really? Mm-hmm. For all summer. It sounds that's it sounds like an adventure and <laughs> kind of majestic. And I can't believe you wouldn't also choose that. I mean, come on, you wanted to be blue. That's all you wanted. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> But you wouldn't get the the sense of satisfaction that I feel like Andy. Can you imagine the the feeling of crawling out? I mean, watch, look at the movie. Him on the ground on his knees crying up into the rain. Like, that has to be the, the most satisfying moment of your entire life, right? I find satisfaction in, like, other ways that don't <laughs> require me to crawl through shit. <laughs> Fair. I don't know. Um... After I wear the fur, do I get to go uh, to live on the beach in Mexico? <laughs> uh, probably not. They don't probably don't pay you that much. Okay. 
Okay. I don't pay you enough to retire to, to Mexico <laughs> after one summer of the fur. But you go, do get to work Disney rules, so it's 15 minutes every hour. And then, but it, but it is from open to close all summer. Well, that's not too bad. Can I call the, crawl through shit for fun? <laughs> yeah, I mean, do yeah. whatever you want, man. Sure, okay. yeah, we support no, you. You can have a you can just have don't your own come hobbies. here to record after. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I guess the the fur would uh, would be uh, my choice. That's so crazy to me. Why? I 100% would crawl through shit. You would die. <laughs> the fumes would kill you. That is not realistic. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah, but after that, you're dead. But like I said, it's... I mean, crawling through a la Andy, which means I like I would succeed. I would get through. It also means you suffered in prison for so many years no, for a crime you didn't commit. That is not true. I only said... Escape right. Shawshank. I didn't say anything about serving the the, the well, sentence. I'm gonna well, go screw to escape that hot mom. To escape <laughs> <laughs> to escape required the length of time. You can't. I like, just are you specific- saying you got thrown into Andy's old cell? Yeah, and they're quantum, like, no, don't look behind that post. I'm talking quantum leap rules. <laughs> where I leapt into Andy the moment he decided to make like the night of the escape. And just had to just had to crawl through that three football fields worth of shit because that's like three hours, right? Like I, mean, I don't know, I don't know how okay, long so it takes. If, you, if it's like, just a quantum the, leap situation, what's the payoff for you? There, yeah, that you I are, don't have to wear the fur all summer. That's yeah, you are <laughs> in a quantum leap situation. <laughs> you are literally saying, "I want to <laughs> teleport into a situation sure. where I crawl through." <laughs> Three football fields. Three football fields <laughs> worth of shit, and then immediately I'm teleported somewhere else. Right. I would, boy, I would love that. <laughs> if, if my other option is wear the fur open to close for an entire summer, then yeah, I will take the thing that I can knock out in a couple hours. I feel like that's uh, all right. I, that's, sure. that's just me. That's just me. I don't. I don't want to. Against one, man. I don't want to spend all that time in a goddamn fur suit for <laughs> my be entire a good summer. Workout. It probably would be both. <laughs> both are probably a decent workout. <laughs> all right, this is gonna be great. I'm actually gonna have to remind you guys of what this is, which means it's a good question. <laughs> would you rather, in one sitting, have to read Fast Cars or The Sudden Dancers? Sudden dancers. The sudden That's dancers. Ben Mears is no, uh, that, no. That sudden dancers is Thad Beaumont's, oh. uh, the the uh, the acclaimed book he tried to write. Sudden after. dancers, one hundred percent. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. Are you kidding? I don't know. Like, like, can you imagine how pretentious Thad Beaumont's writing has to be? Yeah, but I mean, okay, who wrote Fast Cars again? That was uh, misery. Paul. Paul. Yeah. Okay, I was that was, I was his, his mixing it up opus. with uh with, with Stud City. City. <laughs> City. Yeah, that's that's the one totally, that we have yeah. read. In <laughs> yes, Paul. in its entirety. Um, and I assume that Fast Cars is just Stud City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more or less. Um, <laughs> oh, in that case, I'm changing my answer because uh, I, I I thought we were talking about Stud City, which, uh, <laughs> which sucked. Um, <laughs> And who was supposed to suck, because the author was like, yep, I wrote that. That wasn't very good, was it? Right. But Fast Cards, I think what we read of Paul's, because we actually get excerpts from Paul's writing. From we misery. never We never read anything that Thad wrote. And I 100% agree that Thad, <laughs> I guarantee. No, we did read some of what Thad wrote because each chapter opened with a section from the Oh, we the did George read Stark some novels, of the Stark novels. And they were badass. Oh, that's a good yeah, point. So but, George himself writing that, I think it's going to be real cool. Yeah, but the Sudden Dancers is the non George Stark yeah, that's books. Like, Thad Sudden stuff. Dancers is Thad's. Wait, but isn't that the himself. one that the like tipped off the guy to know that he was the same author? It was something it was it was something, something he'd in written there. in yeah. the George Stark book that was also like a few word for word things that were in wow. Sun there, there was a similar theme or element in Sun Dancers, so I think I think it'd still be good. I don't know. I, I just really love uh like near the end of Misery when we're getting to the end of Misery's return. 
I was like really sucked mm-hmm. into that story. And I felt like Paul is probably a pretty damn good writer. And um, as dumb as hell <laughs> as the title Fast Cars is, I don't know. I would definitely give it a chance. I, oh man, this is a tough, and I've had some time to think about this. I think I would go Fast Cars also. As much as I made fun of it, I feel like I could read, I, I could stand to read <laughs> that drivel <laughs> as opposed to the, what I imagine, the highbrow, pretentious as fuck, uh, every sentence I write is poetry, Thad Beaumont. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little hard on Thad. Maybe I have a lot of strong feelings about Thad that I didn't get to reconcile during our episode. Oh, should we have done Mary Fuck Hill? (laughs) (laughs) All right. uh, Keeping in the book-related theme, which fictional book that we've been introduced to would you read in its entirety? Hmm. We've been thrown over the course of these. We've met a lot of writers (laughs) and mentioned a lot of stories. Misery. Misery's return, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. To finish uh, it, because we got it, like you said, Ben, we got yeah, it a little bit, never, and it was cool, and yeah, I'd love to finish that book. <laughs> and we never, uh, we, we're just like Annie, we never get to see the end. Duh. Do, what did you just say? What? Oh, God! <laughs> ben just said we're just like Annie, guys. <laughs> cut working. her mic, cut her mic! <laughs> She's growing uh, stronger! <laughs> <laughs> I would say, uh, I don't remember the title of the book. Oh, I do, actually. I would read The Shadow Exploded. Uh, the <gasps> Oh, yeah! Um, the n- fictional nonfiction book about uh, the Carrie incident. And Ooh, I believe really it's the book answer. that, uh, it's not the book that Sue wrote. Right. right. It's the book that is like the study it's like based off the white papers and stuff. Yeah, and uh, based off the white papers and has, I think they reference it a lot in their talking about mm-hmm. telekinesis. Yeah. Which I would totally read a book that was like, in a world where, <laughs> oh yeah, one time a girl exploded <laughs> and like blew up a town. I want to read, I would totally read a nonfiction study of like their findings. Good and answer. I think, yeah, that's a great answer. And I think that book also is the book that had like excerpts from the, the hearings in yeah. it. Like, so like you'd get all of that. Oh my God. That's a really good answer. Oh um, wait, I'm changing mine. I would read mm-hmm. Annie's um, scrapbook. <laughs> <laughs> you'd go down her memory lane. Yeah. <laughs> Memory I already, lane. I already, memory lane. <laughs> I already chose to go down Annie's memory lane. If you know what I mean. No, Sex. Ben, no. I will. You don't have to say what oh, he means. Sorry. I will see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I'm glad our Christmas episode is what ends our podcast forever because we can't be in the same room with each other anymore after this. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, my answer for this uh, would be. Uh, Steel Machine. Ooh. Mm. Read read the the book that Thad and George were co writing. Like the the little bits we got of like the plot yeah. were so interesting, and the excerpts we got from the other uh, George Stark novels like shows you that they're, they're action packed and they're mm-hmm. pretty kick ass. All and good answers. Alexis yeah. Machine basically is George Stark. Right. So yeah, like having a spinoff series series that is just the adventures of George Stark. Uh, fucking badass murderer guy. <laughs> good title. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I like that. All right, guys. Another, this is a, a an open-ended question, but this is one you might want to put some careful thought into. You have the power to right one wrong or undo any one death or mistake that's been made. What is the one thing you change? Can I give you my knee-jerk reaction? Yeah, of course. Th- without even thinking about it, Carrie immediately came to mind. Because hers was so unfair and tragic. That was yeah. that's the first that that was my knee jerk response to was Carrie's prom. That's a really good answer. My knee jerk reaction, and I don't know what exactly you could do to change it, but something to kill Todd, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like anything that could just like right at the beginning of that story, he knocks on the door and Deucander comes to the door and then I guess 
a bus crashes into his house and kills <laughs> both of them. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I guess something along those lines. I, I totally accept that answer. Yeah. Oh my god. I also, like I said, I also had the the thought of Carrie's prom because yeah, it's just so fucked up, and it would have been. Such an easy mistake to correct. You could have changed any mm-hmm. one of a thousand things to change that story. Uh, but the the thing that I ended up going with um, was I would save Chris Chambers from the body. Mm-hmm. And how he gets stabbed in that oh, fast food yeah. restaurant after everything he went through and, and, you know, fixing his whole life. For that to be the end of that character, uh, I would just... I do want to change that. I feel like that that would be the most satisfying thing. The other, a close second was changing Thad's epilogue. Yeah. yeah. I, I, he definitely he deserves has a sad, better. Yeah. Cause that's a bummer. That's, <laughs> I had no idea. And it's a tragedy doled out across two other books. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> that's, that's kind of that's yeah, kind of right? cheating though, because that didn't happen in any of the books. <laughs> no, I, I give it to sure. Him. Do you guys think we could also save Annie's sanity, which would also save like 30 plus people or victims? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you well, go, you travel back and get Annie a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. What's the, the inciting incident, though? Like, there was no one thing that was like. I don't think we have that information. This is what set her off. Maybe just getting her help yeah. would take care of that. I don't know. Hmm. But I mean, Annie and Carrie have high body counts. Yeah, that That's is true. very true. I think I think Carrie has our highest body count. I was just about to ask, who do you think our highest body count is? I don't know, because they stopped listing off people. Like, I think 30, the, the book lists off about 30, and then you, it just goes, and then you turn the page, and there was more, and then there was more, and then there was more. So I don't think we quite know. Oh, duh. We already answered this earlier in this episode. Barlow. He's ancient. Oh, Yeah. He but has to have killed that's just a hundreds very of thousands good point. of people. I, I can't do that because I, I'm i pretty sure that I became a vampire in the first episode. <laughs> so Barlow is technically my master. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, all right, guys. We only have one, one thing left. One more game to play. All right. So it is Christmas. And you are a member of of the club mm-hmm. and it is your turn to bring the Christmas story. What is the story you share? Oh <laughs> boy. If I remember correctly, the Christmas story is supposed to be the, uh, something uncanny. They yeah. say, right. Yeah, that That's is. a tough one. Yeah. Because, it is. Man, my life's born. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely need a minute to think. CM made a face. Do I admit that I cheated? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, just read off nope. your story from the, the piece of paper yeah. with 10 point font uh, written on it. In you my goddamn defense, lunatic. <laughs> I'm not a storyteller. I'm not an improviser. I, I don't have, like, that's a skill that you kind yeah. of, you... I, th- I assume you're born with it or you develop it and or both. Mm-hmm. And I've done neither. I knew if I sprung this on CM at the time of recording, her brain would literally explode in front of us. <laughs> I, would have, I would have thrown up. <laughs> so, okay. And it's worse because I prepared and it's not going to be good. No, go for I prepared. it. Yeah, man, go for it. <laughs> okay. So a long time ago and before there were cell phones, this part's important there was a little girl named Anna and she lived in a small Midwestern town and she had a loving family and she was a loving girl. Every year in her small town where there otherwise wasn't much to do, the fair would come to town. Anna loved everything about the fair. She was adventurous and there wasn't a ride that she was afraid of. One day Anna decided to get her fortune told and the woman telling her fortune was this old mysterious lady and she had this accent that Anna almost couldn't understand. And she seemed so wise and otherworldly that Anna was taken by her right away. The fortune teller told Anna that someone she loved very dearly was going to die as a result of drowning. Anna left the tent very shaken up. She wasn't 
superstitious as a rule, but something about the fortune teller and what she told her struck her in a way that she couldn't explain. And Anna started to become very paranoid of the water. She begged her family not to go swimming. She begged them not to take baths. She was so adamant and obsessive about this that it started to cause problems between her and her family. As she grew older, her fear only solidified, and when she eventually moved out on her own, she shortly became estranged from her family. Fortunately for Anna, she met a man who couldn't swim and had no desire to, (laughs) and he didn't care anything about her whole water thing. He just accepted her as she was, and it was all good. So they got married, and they had two little boys, twins, Matthew and Jacob. And for a while, things were really good. Anna was still very phobic when it came to the water, and the babies couldn't even be submerged in the bath. Um, Teaching them to swim was out of the question, but her husband didn't mind. He loved Anna, and he loved the boys. One day, tragedy struck. Anna's husband had an accident at work and died, and it was just Anna and the boys now. Matthew and Jacob were a lot alike in pretty much every way, but they were very different in one way. Matthew loved the water. He learned to swim with his friends, and he would sneak away and swim in the creek. And Jacob, on the other hand, seemed to have inherited his mother's phobia. And of course, Anna found out what Matthew was doing, and this was the only strife the family ever had. As the boys grew, Matthew continued to love water, Jacob continued to be afraid, and Anna continued to be afraid for both of them. Every day when the boys left for school in the morning, Anna would tell them, remember what the fortune teller said, someone I love very dearly is going to die as a result of drowning. Your father is already dead, and that leaves only you, and I love you both very, very dearly. There's no one on this earth I love more. If the family was said to have any tradition that they adhered to, that was this daily warning. Naturally, this created some problems for Matthew and Jacob. Matthew became more defiant. He joined the swimming team in high school, and Jacob grew more fearful. He wouldn't even drink out of a full glass of water. As the boys neared graduation, Matthew realized that While he loved his mother, he needed to get away, and more importantly, he needed to get Jacob away. With a lot of work, Matthew convinced Jacob to enroll in the City College of San Francisco, which is right by the ocean. So as you can imagine, Anna was having absolutely no part of that, and the family fought about it daily, but finally she agreed to let them go as long as they made one promise to her, that they would never, under any circumstances, go into the ocean. Jacob agreed right away, and of course Matthew said, "Uh uh-huh, sure, mom. (laughs) having no intention to follow through. So the boys move, and a few months go by without incident. Anna calls every day with her fortune teller's warning, but things are otherwise pretty good. Matthew's been working on Jacob to get him to go into the ocean all this time. And as he gets some distance from his mother, Jacob starts to lose some of that paranoia, and he eventually agrees not to go in, but to go to the ocean. He and Matthew are going to take an umbrella and some chairs and sit at the very edge and let the water roll over their feet. They decide to do this on a Friday after class, and that morning, Anna calls and Matthew picks up. But this call is different. She sounds different. Instead of her usual fortune teller's warning, she tells Matthew that she had a dream that Jacob went to the ocean today and drowned. She asks to talk to him, but he's in the shower. She makes Matthew promise that that they won't go anywhere near the ocean that day and to tell Jacob about the dream that she had and that they'll call her after class so she knows they're safe. So he promises Jacob gets out of the shower and Matthew doesn't say a word. He doesn't want to set Jacob back from all the progress he's made. They go to class, and after that they make their way to the beach and they set up their chairs. Jacob is afraid but brave, and as the first wave gently rolls over his feet, he's transformed. He's scared of the vastness he sees before him, but in a good way. He's in awe of the ocean and he loves the way the water feels and the wet sand underneath his feet. Matthew remembers right then that he has to call his mom, so he tells Jacob he has to make a call, and he runs up to the beach to the road where there's a payphone. He calls his mom, and he tells her that they're at a restaurant with two nice girls, and they're having a great time, and they're nowhere near the water. In the meantime, Jacob is in his chair, and he's becoming more bold, and he decides to move his chair further into the water. And that feels amazing, so he decides that he's going to stand up, and he's going to stand in the water up to his chest. And he's not, he can't swim because his mom would never let them learn how to swim. Except Matthew did, but Jacob can't. So he's not going to go further than that. He's just, he wants to feel the water on his bare chest. As Jacob is moving into the water, Matthew is on the phone with his mom. And a semi is coming down the road. Without warning, the semi crashes into the payphone and Matthew is killed instantly 
and the truck driver is dead too. Later that day, when Jacob comes to the morgue to identify Matthew's remains, or what's left of them, the coroner tells him what he thinks happened based on the autopsy of the semi-truck driver. The driver's body was packed full of drugs, and he still had the needle in his arm when they brought his body in. The coroner thinks he passed out at the wheel, his head was back, and he had overdosed and asphyxiated on his own vomit, essentially drowning. Anna's warning shot through Jacob's head. Someone you love very dearly will die as a result of drowning. And that's when Jacob begins to scream. Whoa! Wow. That's awesome! Really? I'm supposed to follow that? <laughs> yeah, no kidding! <laughs> Jesus Christ! Wow. Can I tell you what I went through for that? <laughs> <laughs> that was great, CM. Thanks. That was super good. <laughs> I, Jesus. So I had been thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I told the man drowning in a phone booth story? Because that, like, that was our yeah! big thing. Yeah! Oh my <laughs> shit! That no, we never like got a resolution to that. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so I this came of wow. that because I was trying to think of how to tell that story, and I couldn't. And then as I was going through my day, pieces of this just started to come. My, Jeez, I am literally. Well, that's it for this episode of Dairy I'm Public Radio. Flabbergasted! <laughs> that is so awesome. I am speechless. Uh, okay, uh, so let's see. I gotta follow that. Um, so my. Christmas story. Okay, I got um one day. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Bart. He's a uh, say sophomore in high school, and he goes to a friend's birthday party, and she's she's turning, I don't know, fifteen, however old sophomores are, and uh, Bart drinks like seven or eight Pepsi's. And then they walk to a nearby playground and um, he has a stomach ache. So he runs into the woods and shits my pants. I mean, Bart's <laughs> pants. It's a very uncanny. <laughs> that is a fictional story that has never happened to anyone in this room. <laughs> Oh and that's God. the quality you get when you don't tell one of your co-hosts <laughs> to write a goddamn story. 100% worth it. Oh. All right. So, Way to one-up me, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for my Christmas story, uh, I, I've talked about this before on the show when we did Joyland. About We, we had the discussion of whether or not uh, everybody here believes in ghosts or not. And I mentioned that... I did believe in ghosts. Uh, so uh, the story that I'm going to tell is my true reason. The moment that I decided that I believed in ghosts. Right out of high school, I was offered a job. Uh, somebody that I know, his cousin is a psychic. A psychic who has helped the St. Louis Police Department solve uh, several unsolved murder cases. Um, this was at the time when Ghost Hunters was a, a major show. Everybody was all about Ghost Hunters. And uh, this psychic had actually worked with the people from TAPS that had uh, had done this. And that is kind of how things worked through Grapevine to, to get this show. So he was given the money and the budget to produce a pilot to do a ghost hunting show. And I was hired to host that show. Um, and so that's what first got me started really looking into the world of the paranormal and ghosts. Because I'd always been open-minded to it, but I'd never really had that experience one way or another. There are things that could be mistaken as uh, the imagination of a child um, and, and any circumstance that you can kind of explain away. So I came into this job. I was very excited. I, I, I thought this, like this was going to be my big break. This was going to be that, that moment, which right out of high school would have been utterly insane. So in order to get a, a taste for what I was going to be a part of, I joined the ghost hunting team that they had. And I went on several investigations so that I could see firsthand how evidence was collected, how they went through things, so I would know what I was talking about when the time came. Several investigations had come and gone, and 
there were little things here that uh, like, oh, that's that's interesting. That that could be something. But there's there's no proof. Uh, um, a sound that would happen that uh, I, I couldn't pick up on. But they told me they could. Um, there were certain things that we had totally, uh, totally revealed as something entirely different somebody thought their house was haunted we found all the things to conclude no these are the things that are causing problems um and that is why you feel this way uh so a lot of good was done as a part of of this group and i really enjoyed it i found it so interesting and as i went i became more and more skeptical because most of the things that i experienced were just not not at the level that i had anticipated until one investigation we were allowed into a building that uh, it was four stories tall. It used to be an old factory. Each of the four stories was available for rent. However, the third and fourth floor of this building could not hold tenants for more than two months. Anybody who tried to stay there, this massive factory, they just couldn't stay in this space. They said they were uncomfortable. They said it it didn't feel safe and they just didn't want to be there. There was a point where those floors became storage for other people. So there was nobody actively in there. People would just bring things. And a worker there had told us that on the fourth floor, especially if he had to deliver something nine times out of 10, he would approach the threshold of the entrance to that floor and just throw it in so he did not have to be in that room by himself. So I went on this investigation. This was one of the few times that I was in the forefront. I had the the recording equipment. I had uh, sensors. I had everything. And because this giant building, we needed to get as much as we could. Uh, So we did our our initial sweep, found uh, some places of interest, some stories we'd found about uh, some deaths in the building and and where we, we... figured those might be located and there was one room that was substantially colder than any other part of the room and at first i dismissed it it was an exterior wall all all of the the things my rational brain could think of these are all the reasons that this is different but even thinking of the real reasons it was just so cold and we we tried several different things and we didn't seem to get any reactions and we're packing up for the end of the night and the rest of the team has left and it's just me and two other people. And before we leave the guy who was the lead investigator, he looks over me. He's like, Josh, you, uh, you, you did great on this. Um, there's something we haven't tried and it's something you've never done. And we thought you might want to give it a shot since we're packing up, we're getting ready to go. And that is um, to antagonize. It's where you you would set the recorder down and you aggressively talk to whatever spirit or force is in this room. And you you try to lure them into doing something to prove they're there. And the thought scared the hell out of me. But I did it. I was like, all right, if this is the last thing we're doing, I'm all for it. So that we set up the, the recorder and the sensors and they are all the way across the room watching me. They've got the camera on me. And I just start talking trash to a, an empty room slash ghost. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just and, and I, I was very nervous about it. So it wasn't even that aggressive. But as I went, I just I started getting more and more comfortable um, and and just being sounding as arrogant and, and everything as I possibly could. And finally, like I'm, I'm yelling. I, I'm taunting this this ghost. And I was like, well, if you you know if you're here, do something. Like make a move, or else we are all packing up, and you are never going to see another group of people here again to prove that you exist. And there was no nothing. And then so finally, I went. So what are you a fucking coward? And the reading next to me spiked so hard, and I didn't notice it at the time. The people across the room they saw it light up behind me. And so I I called it a coward a couple more times. Nothing happened. We pack up. I was like, all right, it was it was worth a try. It was it was, you know, 
something I've never done before. I'm glad I did it. I've seen them do it on TV. It was interesting. Kind of cathartic. Very cool. Uh, a week later, I get a phone call asking me to come down to the studio where they do all of the, where they go through the footage and they, they go through all the sound. And the guy sits me down. He's like, remember when we had you do this? Um, we've got, we actually have some, like, some very cool stuff. But there's something I want to bring you in before uh, we show it to anybody. Because I, I want to make sure that I'm not like hearing something. Or it's, I want to make sure you didn't, uh, you didn't say something under your breath. Or anything, anything weird like that. Can you listen to this and tell me what you hear? So I put on the headphones and uh, he turns it up and I'm, I'm holding him to my head. And I hear myself shouting. And this moment where they, they lined it up with the, the camera. And you can see the timestamps where I scream what are you, a fucking coward? As clear as anything I've ever heard whispered into my ear, I hear, you're the coward. And it was the most terrifying, like as clear as I can hear my own voice in these headphones. I threw them off onto the table and he goes, what did you hear? And I told him, and he's like, that's exactly what I heard. And that was the moment that I believed that maybe not ghosts in the traditional sense, but I believe that there is something other connected to our world. We're having a slumber party now, right? (laughs) I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep. (laughs) There are none of us near the controls for the computer or anything, but honest to God, near the end of that story, I thought if he's like, and I put on the headphones and I heard... I swear to God, if there's another voice shows up in our house, <laughs> I'm out of here. I am. If I could somehow make that happen. <laughs> this whole thing is an elaborate ruse to scare the shit out of Ben. To, to make Bart shit his pants. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the end of our Merry Dairy Christmas special. Uh, just before we get out of here, we want to say one more time, thank you guys so much for listening. It has been so exciting uh, and so gratifying that so many of you have enjoyed the show. And uh, and we appreciate everybody who's been uh, leaving reviews. Please leave us uh, some more reviews. It does a great help. Uh, it's just, I, I can't express enough gratitude. Seriously, guys, it's, it's awesome. We love doing this show. We love getting to explore some of our favorite books. And uh, thank you so much for for coming on the journey with us. And I think it's safe to say that we have a really awesome fan base. We get the most thoughtful and humorous and amazing comments on our Facebook page and on our emails. And it's the best. For CM Alexander and Benjamin Graham, this is Joshua Kahn reminding you, have yourself a very Merry Dairy Christmas. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. We hope you enjoyed this bonus holiday episode, a Merry Dairy Christmas special. We wish you all a happy holidays. As always, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. You can also email us at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. If you liked our bonus episode, please rate and review us on iTunes. That's all for now. Wait. Did you guys hear that? Huh. Anyway, goodbye, listeners.